you know, this thing called, uh, you know, filial piety is seen from one person's perspective, um, whereas I, I interpret filial piety from a very different point of view. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm questioning the balance uh, of, of the patriarchal order in 21st century Singapore. So, um, and in my, even in my own family, yeah. A little nugget of uh, <coughs> trivia was that the, uh, the four crazy sisters with the, with the, with the insane hair, um, those, those are obviously cartoonish characters, but they're based on my aunt. In her life. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> one of them uh, showed up at one of my uh, relatives, you know, dressed in bright red. And you know, if, if you know Chinese, uh, uh, tradition and custom, you, you go to a funeral in black or white or somber colors, uh, here's this woman who shows up with bright red lipstick and big hair and a bright red, you know, cocktail dress. So, you know, these, these things do happen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Talking about the East-West um, sort of um, uh, well, East -West, uh, tension, <clears throat> um, I suppose for those of you who, who know my first film, um, I, I sort of explore it there as well uh, in Forever Fever. Um, it's, it's all about me growing up in Singapore in the 70s and being faced with you know, this tension between who am I? Am I Chinese? Am I Asian? Or am I Western, you know, which values do I adopt? Um, so I, I suppose subliminally or unconsciously, I, I, I use that here as well. Um, for those of you also who know Forever Fever and who think that this is a major departure, um, it, it, it actually isn't because um, I see Forever Fever as a document, a record of my life um, in the 70s, grew up in a much poorer Singapore, you know, a developing country at the time, but a much happier Singapore. It was a much simpler lifestyle, simpler life that we had. Um, but that was my record of my Singapore in the 70s. This is my record of my Singapore as it is today. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just have to ask this question. Sure. Do you have any problems with the census? <clears throat> well, if you notice, there's, some, there's a jump cut there, and very untidy, mm. but, you know, unfortunately, the, the <coughs> census wanted to cut that, and it's, it's quite ridiculous, because really, it's, it's a shot of Adrian humping Shemei Nang, his <laughs> Chinese, Chinese lover, um, uh, on the staircase, and yes, he is humping her, but the way I shot it is, you know, he had a long shirt on, he pulled Charles down in his underwear, but he had a long shirt, shirt so you don't actually see any flesh. You just see him humping her, um, and they found that you know not <laughs> suitable for um, you know, kids uh, age 16 and 17 uh, and and below. So that was cut, unfortunately. And of course, <clears throat> although they allowed the um, the full nudity um, of the ghost uh, played by Emma Young, um, I, of course I had to pixelate her, the, what they call the triangle, the black triangle. <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's unfortunate because you know I was in Tokyo last week and Busan the week before, and they saw it in its full glory, um, the, the the way we we made it to be seen. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I I think when the DVD version is released, uh, that will be completely uncensored, and um, so will um, yeah. So so yeah. Uh, we have a. Uh is you, uh, Sui Lin and Emma here as well. So if you have any questions to ask them, please feel free to ask. Yeah, so I have a question. I don't think Ken seen the twist of fate. I don't think you have, have you? <coughs> And we never even spoke about it, did we? Yeah. Um, no. No. Um, what were the other references? There was a blogger who made references to Twist of Fate and, oh, Haunted. 
yeah, haunted as well. No, I mean, neither can mm -hmm. nor I saw haunted. So um, we didn't actually refer to, to those two, actually. Yeah. Music was very, um, quite similar in opening. Similar as Twist of Fate, is it? Oh, right, okay. Yeah. I'm curious about the ending. How do you decide it? I think the ending was um, the, the most difficult thing of the film. And um, uh, it, it was uh, you know, the original conception by um, Ken himself. Um, why don't you tell them a bit about the ending and, and how you you wrote three quarters and you knew you, you didn't do anything. Um, By the way, was there an alternative? <laughs> okay, no, there was no alternative. Uh, as, as Glenn mentioned earlier on, this was my first screenplay. So I, I, I mean it when I say I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I just sort of, um, it, was, it was sort of instinctive, you know, uh, storytelling in a way. Uh, and I've now since learned that you do not start writing a screenplay without knowing the ending. Uh, deadly, don't try it at home kind of thing, you know. So, uh, what happened was we, we knew that we had a murder mystery, but we had no murderer. We also didn't really have a murder victim. It was all uh, one big red herring. I mean, it was a device, it was a platform to to delve deeper into these characters' lives. I mean, we, I do sometimes wonder whether we oversell the fact that it's a murder mystery because in fact, very little of it is, is truly a murder mystery in the, with the kind of plot intricacies that you get with Agatha Christie and, and Robert Altman and so on. So, no, I, I had no idea how the film would end. I just had this really overly loqua loquacious police officer yapping on and on about who did this and what's going to happen to the company and uh, I didn't know how it was going to end. Uh, so two thirds of the way through, I was going to call Glenn up and say, help me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, then I, I, I thought about it a little bit more and I thought, it's interesting when you look at this patriarch and think of him as a passive murderer, not as one who is, uh, you know, he, he doesn't kill you. He, he gives you a long rope to hang yourself <laughs> by. So, you know, with that idea in mind, I went with uh, the heart attack and, uh, and the secret behind the heart attack. Yeah, it is different, but uh, the theatrical and, and film acting, of course, is very different. And, but, I mean, over the years, we have done quite a few movies, except that, of course, we've done a lot more theatre than movies. I think this, this role was really, again, fake, because I don't think Glenn had really pictured me as the Tegliam character initially. And he, he had asked me, maybe you can play Tek Ming, you know? And, and if I get Kei Tong, then you can beat him up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to beat up Kei Tong, you know? <laughs> oh yeah, sure, oh, yeah, I'd like to. So that was sort of on the cards, and then I knew Glenn had gone around the world in his, in his uh, search for, for cast. So I said, oh, finish lah, you know? <laughs> He's not going to cast a Singaporean, get, like Asian-American or London Chinese or something, you know? But he came back, and then he said, what about Tek Liang, you know? And I didn't know much about the story. And it was amazing that, like, some of my personal history, my love for music, um, the fact that my father wouldn't allow me to play the violin once I got interested in it. Not didn't allow me, but sort of said, hmm, are you sure you want to be second violinist in a second-rate orchestra? Because only the really talented four-year-olds and five-year-olds who are brilliant then really make good solo careers. So he was really trying hard to talk me out of it, and I sensed it. And what I did was very similar to that. I gave up the violin for like 10 years. 
in my own personal sort of anger and resentment, I suppose. But those things, I could really